Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is from Cycle Computing. We have Jason Stowe. He is the CEO of the company. Jason, how are you doing today? Rich, it's great to be here. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Well, well, well welcome back. You know, I, I know you guys were at the AWS Invent Conference this week. How did that go? Reinvent was pretty awesome, actually. There was a, a pretty surprising... Uh, a number of folks, I think, that had doubled in size approximately from the prior year. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's very clear there's a lot of folks paying attention to cloud now, and, and we're obviously really excited about uh, the capability of, of using that to, uh, uh, to to accelerate science, to accelerate engineering. We're, we're definitely pretty psyched about the, um, uh, the level of participation at the conference. There were companies from life sciences to manufacturing, uh, a lot of universities, a lot of uh, government research sites, uh, there was it, it was actually uh, a very impressive uh, breadth and diversity um, between the U.S. and, and globally uh, in terms of the number of people that were here and where they were from and what industry it was it was it was shocking. Wow, I mean, I mean, my buddy tried to get a ticket a month ago and the thing was completely sold out. So I I, I believe it. Wow. So. Yeah, it's not quite up to supercomputing. Supercomputing is <laughs> still bigger. Yeah. So yeah. we're, you know, we're getting, but it's getting there. And, and I definitely think, um, you know, between that and I know uh, some of the other cloud providers have had very large events as well. There's uh, a lot of uh, a lot of momentum behind, uh, you know, the three public majors, AWS and and, and Google and Azure. Uh, so I think there's um, uh, a lot of really exciting stuff going on in this space, and, and we're just happy to be, you know, here kind of at the right place at the right time. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the meantime, you guys had a pretty exciting announcement this week about a world record, and uh, I I brought up your slides. Why don't we go through that, and then we'll we'll do a Q and A at the end. You got it. That sounds like a plan. Um. So, so yeah. So essentially, um, you know, at, at Cycle, we we really believe that um, access to to cloud cluster computing is going to be the single largest accelerator of science and engineering and risk management over the next. Uh, 10 to 20 years, I think, you know, the, the removal of um, uh, constraints uh, on the kinds of questions that you can ask by making it, you know, really efficient and really cost-effective uh, for someone to grab uh, large amounts of capacity and, and ask questions that they normally wouldn't be able to ask because they, they you know, basically wouldn't fit up the cluster that they have in-house. In uh, it's going to be a huge change for the industry as a whole, and, and this workload is really an example of that. So uh, if you go to the next slide, um, you know, basically Western Digital uh, subsidiary named HGST. Uh, so HGST um, uh, was basically transforming um, uh, a particular workload that had to do with drive head design. So as, as heads flow above the platter, the, the heads themselves are made of um, uh, significant uh, numbers of materials, uh, and, and different configurations. And so uh, on a science side, they had a 30-day workload if they ran it in-house that essentially explored a hundred, uh, pardon me, a million different permutations of these potential designs. And so this was a, a parameter sweep across basically 22 different uh, parameters uh, and three different media types for the platters themselves. And, and the HCSC guys are, are really amazing. So Steve Philpott's the CIO and David Hines runs uh, computing across data center and infrastructure for them. And, and they're really just trying to enable uh, an increase in throughput for their engineering folks. They want folks to be able to get engineering and science done uh, significantly faster than they ever were able to do before. Uh, and a lot of the work that we've been doing with them over the last year and a half, two years, has just been uh, amazing to watch. Um, there's a great YouTube video by Steve Hines uh, on production uh, HPC in the cloud uh, at reInvent last year. Uh, and, and this is really a case study of, of kind of the next level of where they've gotten to. Um, on the business side, though, you know, essentially what they're trying to do is just innovate, right? They want to be able to get um, iterations done of designs and make them better and make them faster. They currently have the highest capacity drives, uh, which are helium-filled, kind of hermetically sealed 10 terabyte drives. And the way they figured out how to do that was by doing computational fluid dynamics of the platter spinning. Um, this workload is more of a material science and engineering workload, just making it so that those drive heads were as efficient as possible. And so if you go to the next slide, um, we found out about this workload last Wednesday, actually. So we, we actually didn't know this existed a little over a week ago. On Tuesday of last week, we had no idea we were going to do this. Uh, on Wednesday, we found out about the workload. And over the weekend, we ran what we're calling the Gojira run. And Gojira is the, uh, uh, the, the synonym for Godzilla. Um, so this was a, a monster run. 
It ran across three different regions. We basically did the 70 and three quarter years of computing required for this drive head design. So this parameter sweep was essentially seven decades of computing. Um, it was a million drive head designs, and we actually ran that in eight hours uh, instead of the 30 days that it would take in-house. And so you can imagine that the throughput increase in terms of design. And they had an in-house application called MRM uh, that had a kind of a MATLAB post process on it. And they used um, uh, our software and, and we use uh, you know, the open source tool Chef uh, to help with software configuration. So those were some of the applications that were involved. And essentially across three regions, we got 50,000 cores in the first 23 minutes and uh, topped out at around 70,908 cores. Uh, across those three regions. Um, that, if you <coughs> essentially use the Intel Impact benchmark on each node and edit it together, so kind of a half cousin of RPEAK and RMAX, um, you get 729 teraflops of RPEAK, which is you know, more than the number 63 on the top 500 list published last June. And um, essentially the infrastructure cost, all of this was done for $5,594. Wow. Um, so it was, yeah, it's um, uh, radical acceleration an increase in throughput for these guys. And um, this is the kind of stuff that, like Steve and David's team, they're just doing an amazing job of leveraging external capacity to, to increase the throughput of their uh, their engineers. It's it's unbelievable. Um, so yeah, so there's there's essentially a, you know, in the next slide, we talk a little bit about the value of timing, but there's a few points around this. And I, you know, I'd love to discuss this with you, Rich, around, but, but basically, you know, there's the, the whole We've, we can actually get this up and running in a, a, a day or two at this large scale. This is really a push-button operation at this point. I remember probably when I talked to you, we did that 10,000 core run four years ago yeah. uh, with Genentech, mm -hmm. um, and that was a real out-of-band activity. It took you know months of preparation. Yeah. Um, now, you know, the last 156,000 core run we did uh, took about a month of preparation, just, to, you know, four weeks of, of getting ready to grab every spare core we could get out of AWS spot instances. And, and now to be able to do this in, in two to three days with no notice uh, and then publish it and talk about it the next week with you, is yeah. just a, you know, it's a crazy acceleration and, and really increases the agility. It makes it so people can react to new data that they get and, and basically, oh, geez, i got to go redo this design and push the button and get it done. And that was, you know, that was kind of a really a big deal. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the last, the last couple of things are just really about capacity. So, you know, you've, you can get 50,000 cores in 23 minutes. That means the kinds of problems you can ask um, and solve are, are 50,000 cores in scale now, which is normally, you know, a couple of orders of magnitude bigger than, than what most of us have on our internal clusters. Um, and, and essentially being able to get the result back so much faster allows you to kind of do an iterative design, increase your throughput. Uh, and the fact that, that Ivy Bridge processors, and now um, obviously there's, there's the, the new C4 instance types that were announced this week on, on AWS have, have even newer processors, but, um, but the, the Ivy Bridge actually did a great job of giving us a great flop count uh, against the problem at an exceptionally reasonable cost. So it was, um, it was a, a really big deal from a timing perspective. That was one of the things that we really wanted to showcase around this use case is that you can get up and running quickly, you can approach bigger problems fast, and, uh, and you can increase your throughput in a, in a way uh, that you could never do before. So in terms of um, you know what's different about this run, there was the new scale. If you go to the next slide, and, and, and there was new industry, new agility, um, <laughs> and a new processor that we were using. So on the scale side, we, we essentially had a, a much larger customer than we've announced before. So this is a, a Fortune 500. Uh, and, and now R&D basically has uh, the scale they need to ask the, the question that will actually change their design process rather than the one that fits on the cluster. And um, uh, this is also manufacturing, and I think that's a big deal uh, because uh, we're entering the early majority. So we're, we're no longer in um, you know, the early adopters and the innovators on, on the Jeff Moore uh, crossing the chasm inside the tornado um, process here. We're, we're no longer in the earliest part of the market. Uh, life sciences was definitely that in 2008, in 2009, 2010. They were the first into the cloud. Uh, but manufacturing generally moves a lot slower. Steve's obviously really innovative. Uh, but from a practical standpoint, this is really a clear indicator that cloud is getting broadly adopted for technical computing. And um, again, getting those cores as quickly as we did and being able to be as cost effective on a flop count basis uh, were really different than, than the last run. We actually had 50% more flops per core. Um, 
out of the Ivy Bridge nodes than we did uh, when we ran the 156,000 core uh, run before. And, and that's really the story. I mean, there's a lot of great pictures. If you go to the next slide, there's, um, you know, here's the 70,908 cores running and, uh, you know, 728.95 uh, teraflops associated with it. There's just a, a, a very large set of um, uh, processing power that's just available to you if you dip in and get it. And, and, and really, we were, we were just excited to be a part of this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's amazing. You're really talking about a, a petascale capability there if you would measure it in um, peak flops, right? Certainly. Right. Uh, yeah. And there's, last I checked, there were like maybe 35 of those in the entire planet, uh, machines of that of that grandeur, right? So, and you spun this up in minutes or hours, whatever it was. It's, uh, it's yeah, so about 30 minutes, we got, we got a, about two-thirds or three-quarters of the core count, and then... Mm -hmm. um, uh, by the time an hour had passed, we had uh, a majority of the 70,000 cores. So it was yeah. um, it was a, a fairly fast, a lot faster than waiting for it to arrive, get off the loading dock, and, <laughs> and rack stack it and cable it. Well, I'll tell you that. Well, that you know that's an important point, Jason, because uh, when you think about how long it takes uh, somebody like uh, Oak Ridge to get Titan up and fully productive, it is yep. months, if not years. Um, yep. And. Um, you know, and that's now, obviously a lot of smart people working uh, long hours. So yeah, um, and there's definitely an economy of scale that you're taking. Now, there are, are of course trade-offs, and I can yeah. hear my inner HPC nerd. You know, I worked at the the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, part of the Mellon Institute, uh, in the in the CompChem group there mm -hmm. uh, under Charlie Brooks back in the early 90s on a Cray T3D. And so my my inner nerd is saying, well, the interconnect's not as fast, but that's true. Yes. But but at the same point, um, you know, a lot of the problems that are in the newer sciences, uh, in analytics. Uh, in uh, design optimization, et cetera, are, are really geared towards throughput. They're not geared towards um, uh, uh, you know, big MPI. Now, that's not yeah. to say, yeah, yeah, capability is still important. We yeah. still need those really large, fast interconnect machines for sure. what they do. But there are new classes of workload where you want to find the material that has the right solar panel property, and so it makes sense to create 156,000 core for that that's loosely coupled because the problem is loosely coupled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I don't want anybody to think that this is going to replace a capability machine tomorrow. It's not the, uh, that's not the goal. This is a different problem set. Right. But we do see more and more use cases where even on the inner loop, if you have an MPI job that maybe runs on one machine or four machines or mm -hmm. eight machines, um, there still are th a lot. The outer loop is almost always a throughput orientation. So there's the evaluation of different initial conditions on the simulation, or the evaluation of different designs. Um, these these kinds of patterns are, are things that the needle in the haystack problems, if you will, yeah. uh, are things that we see you know really over and over again. Yeah, you know, you think about a, a company the size of Western Digital. Certainly, if they had the will, they could pay 30 million for a machine of this size, right? And probably another 10 for the building to uh, power and cool it, right? But uh, yep. a 40 million outlay versus, what, you know, 5,500 bucks. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to argue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Especially for something you're going to run once a month. You know, yes. like they're going to run this once right. every three, four weeks, and they're going to pull the trigger on it, and yeah. then... And yeah. then be done on it. it would just yeah. you'd never you it just doesn't pencil out. So, uh, all right. Yeah, so, the thing you, I, you know, right, well, what's the net net out of this? I mean, you're 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 proving a really uh, industrial use case here within a very short amount of uh, preparation time. Uh, is cycle ready to you know say come get your flops? Yeah, we definitely we definitely feel like we are. We, yeah. we we've been seeing a really rapid um, uh, adoption increase across multiple different industries. So now we have a significant number of um, uh, the majority of the the top ten pharma, basically mm -hmm. uh, a large number of insurance and finance. So we have hedge funds and banks and and <clears throat> very large. You know, we have a Fortune uh, 100 insurance company that hopefully we'll be able to name at some point in the future. Yep. Uh, but they're running a regulatory workload that's you know tens of thousands of cores at the end of every month. So these kinds of um, uh, workloads are just getting more and more common. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we've we've got it, so it's pretty push button to do it. But but I you know, and as much as I, I like talking about cycle, obviously I'm I'm really excited about uh, where we are, and and the, we've been you know doubling in size and seeing all kinds of um, uh, different customer use cases come through. And the fact that manufacturing is now in the door uh, to me indicates that that you know we're in the majority 
now. This is no longer early adopters. Right. Um, but the the thing that I think is is most important about this is is actually the higher order bit. So it's it's mm-hmm. again <clears throat> everybody should be sizing the question um, to what is actually going to change their business. So they yeah. they should not be asking the question that fits on their cluster. They should really be asking the question that'll actually make it so your research is is that much better. Your designs are are improved. Um, your risk management is better. Those those use cases are things where uh, extra compute is now cost effective and <clears throat> able to be consumed uh, at vast scale compared to what we're normally able to do. So yeah. the message out of this is really don't think about capacity. Think about the science. Think about the engineering. Go invent and discover. Do better work, and we'll build the infrastructure to answer that question. Whatever that question is, we can actually achieve the scale required uh, in order to be able to answer it. Now, obviously, this has got a throughput orientation, but I think um, uh, from a practical standpoint, we're seeing a, a really awesome scientific and engineering results come out of uh, these kinds of computers, and I'm just excited that you know it's kind of proliferating. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jason, help me put this in perspective. If, if there was no cycle computing in the world, how hard would it be to do what you guys just did this week? So it's a great question. Uh, so as I mentioned, when we did the first 10,000 core run, it was several months of, of preparation. We have we have uh, folks that we've interacted with that, that come to us after they've spent 12 months trying to get a production system up and running mm-hmm. with um, several thousand cores in it, like yeah. you know four to four to six. Yeah. Um, we just had one of those come through actually not too not too long ago. Uh, so the the <clears throat> the net net, I guess, is that you know there's a lot in terms of security automation, making sure the encryption keys are managed properly, doing proper data scheduling, uh, dealing with the different uh, deployments in, across virtual private uh, networks, so the, the VPC capability. Um, we actually ran this entire workload inside of a VPN. Mm. Uh, so it was all across the virtual private cloud, which means the different AZs that we used in this environment, when we used three regions, we were using multiple different sets of data centers uh, and the yeah. networks affiliated with them. And when we did that, we were actually uh, routing uh, the work centrally and, and putting them into each of the different subnets and grabbing the results back out separately. And so those um, that, that's a really complicated thing to do well Yes. Um, uh, or, and get working in the first place, honestly. So... From a from a practical standpoint, with without us, you basically would have a lot of either you know duct tape and bubble gum of different tool chains together, or you'd have a lot of software to write. We've spent about um, I think over the last eight years, we've spent 19 million dollars on on building out product and engineering. Uh-huh. Uh, we've got about 120 man years of of software uh, written yeah. uh, to basically do these problems. Um, so you know, getting it up and running for one use case. It's probably a doable thing in six to twelve months, and getting it working really well, and and mm-hmm. being very very reliable, and and what have you. Yeah. Um, getting it done for all of your workloads, getting it done across regions, uh, those are the things that are definitely more challenging, but where there's a lot of uh, benefit because you can achieve scale, and that's that's really um, where I think we close the gap. We make that very easy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is very exciting, uh, Jason. I guess uh, congratulations are in order. Oh, thanks a lot, Rick. I definitely look forward to seeing you in New Orleans. I, I imagine you have a very full roster. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing. I think I have 50 interviews scheduled or something ridiculous. But uh, yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I'm gonna probably gonna be watching almost every single one of them. So I really appreciate. <laughs> well, you know, I'm one of you and covering everything. Oh, I'm one of your biggest fans as well. So uh, thank you, thank you for coming on the show, Jason. Thanks for having me, Rick. All right, you, take care. You bet. All right, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.